joining us. Okay, does any of, do any of you guys know what it is? Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Good. I'm going to read you guys the words of the song. It says, I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray, and find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And then it goes on to say, Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. I think it's working. <clears throat> just hold it in the air. That's great. So that song I just played, everybody out there knew it was called Jesus Paid It All. And it's a combination of an old hymn and a new praise and worship song. One of the things that we do when we come to church is worship the Lord with our praise songs. Well, why do you think we do this? Anybody have a thought about why do we praise the Lord in church? Because he's watching over us, okay? Any other ideas? Yep. Since he died for our sins. Yes, he died for our sins. <coughs> Did you hear that? Because we're supposed to pay him respect, and he's the Lord, and this is his house, and because Jesus died for us, and because he's close to us. That is all very true. We thank him for all that he does and all that he's done for us, and we honor him for his awesome qualities like his love, his power, his forgiveness, and wisdom, and we show him that we need him and that we're trusting him. So worshiping God is like praying. It's something we Christians can do anytime and anywhere. And it helps us to stay close to him. In the book of Psalms in the Bible, chapter 22, verse 3, it says, the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. That's amazing. Did you know that the Lord lives in our praises? So when we're scared or sad or angry, one of the best things that we can do is praise the Lord. The Lord is near us when we're worshiping him, and he'll chase away our fears and our tears. Now, in the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, the people of God were very afraid. You see, the armies of Israel's enemies were marching against the city of Jerusalem. And their plan was to destroy it and to kill God's people. So their king Jehoshaphat called all the people together and they all prayed to the Lord for help and protection. And the Holy Spirit gave them this message through one of their worship leaders. He said to them, don't be afraid, don't lose hope because of this huge army. You see, the battle isn't yours, it's mine. You will not have to fight this battle. Just march out, take up your positions, and watch. And you will see how I will save you, Judah, and Jerusalem. And the people of God heard the message, and they praised and worshiped the Lord. Now, early the next morning, they all got up, and they put on their armor, and their, they took up their swords and their weapons, and they started to march out to battle. But before they could leave, their king, King Jehoshaphat, did something very different. You know what he did? Anybody know this story? Okay, I'll tell you what he did. In front of the soldiers, he put the singers and the musicians to lead the way, singing and praising the Lord. And so they obeyed the Lord, and God kept his promise to them. Judah's enemies never attacked them. Instead, they attacked each and killed each other, and God saved his people miraculously that day. So just in closing, I want you to remember that just like prayer, God wants us to praise him every day. In another book in the Bible called Zechariah 4, verse 6, it says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So remember that our worship is like a weapon that God uses to chase Satan away. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you for each child that's here and each family that's represented. 
And Lord, as we come to you today in your house, we remember that you have been so faithful to us. Help us to remember that you have given us two very special weapons against our enemy. That is prayer, and that is praise. So help us to remember every day to worship you and to talk with you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. See you later. I'm going to have to make Mark jealous. I got applause as I came up. <laughs> Good morning. It's great to be here with you guys today. It's fun uh, as people were coming in with my opportunity up at Triumph to get to know some of you young adults who were in the Fargo-Moorhead area at college and were serving at Triumph as volunteers uh, to see familiar faces, uh, faces of students that I've gotten to know through trips with Mark, the youth convention, the Mexico trip, and uh, also just out at camp as well. So it's fun to be here with you today, even though I've never gotten to worship, there's familiar faces and you know those that I get to meet today. And uh, we thank you for allowing us to be here with you this morning. Um, so this morning, uh, we're going to continue going through Esther, which Mark started last week. And uh, we're going to be reading from Esther chapter 3 today. But before we look at this week's text, I want to step back and quickly revisit uh, what has taken place in chapters 1 and 2 um, that Pastor Mark looked at last week. See, the story of Esther begins not with Esther as the queen, uh, but we have Queen Vashti. From what we can gather in these first chapters is that King Xerxes was a man that chose his queen as a mantelpiece. Someone, or maybe you could even say something that he could show off for her beauty. And Vashti doesn't seem to be willing to play along any longer at this point, as King Xerxes calls her forward in front of a banquet to be paraded around. She refuses to be shown off for her beauty. As such, King Xerxes consults with um, his nobles and wise men and has her removed from her position. Oftentimes, when you disobey a king, you're executed, but... For some reason, with Queen Vashti, she's just removed. Well, a search then begins to ensue for a new queen, because the king must have his queen. And uh, this process, he calls forward all of the, the virgins and the maidens and the, and the beautiful women of his kingdom uh, to be paraded in front of him so he can spend uh, a year-long process selecting his next queen. In this process, Esther becomes noticed. She begins to win favor and is moved through the selection process and finally at the end of this process is proclaimed the new queen. We, Pastor Mark does not paint King Xerxes in a positive light. Um, you know, I think he used the word pig and just a man of very, very poor character in, in just being prideful and conceited. You know, but behind the scenes we learned that Esther was raised by her uncle Mordecai and that they are Jews. They're living in exile in King Xerxes' kingdom. Paranoia or smart intuition has led Mordecai to instruct Esther before going into this process not to reveal who she was truly, that she was a Jew. And now as I was reading through this story, I had flashes of Cinderella. As the king's messengers go out into the kingdom, proclaiming that there's going to be a ball, that they could come and impress the, king, the prince and win a chance to, to court the prince and become the, his, his wife. Or from Snow White of Queen Vashti, although she didn't lose her beauty, she's refusing it, but I had, I had images of Queen Vashti standing before this mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And not getting the response of her, but that of Esther. Who knows, maybe this is where these stories begin. But as we come to the start of our text in chapter 219, Esther has been crowned queen and we return back to the outside of the king's palace where Mordecai learns of a plot to assassinate King Xerxes. There's, there's commentaries and books that say that this plot could have been because people were fed up with the king taking their young available women. And as, king, as Pastor Mark said last week, is he didn't just parade them around. The king did whatever he wanted with these women, thus taking advantage of a whole generation of the kingdom's people. So that may have been why they were plotting to kill the king. But because of Esther's position, Mordecai goes to Esther and tells her of this plot against the king. 
She gives Mordecai credit when she goes before the king, and the king takes matters into his own hand and has these um, guards executed, and, he's, and he stops the assassination plots in their tracks. Now, Mordecai is given credit, but he doesn't receive any formal acknowledgement for what he has done. And this is where we're going to pick up reading. And it's a large section today, but because it's predominantly just one big story, I wanted to read all of chapter 3 with you. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn with me from, to Esther chapter 3, and I'll be reading from the NIV. Esther chapter 3. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of, the, of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him, but Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke of him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, they cast the pur, which is the lot, in the presence of Haman to select a day and month and the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. The Haman, then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom, whose customs are different from those of all other people, and who do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. And I will put 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury for the men who carry out this business. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. He said, King, keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you choose. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews. Young and old, women and little children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was issued to, as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. Spurred on by the king's command, the couriers went out, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink but the city of Susa was bewildered. So imagine you're sitting in your town center, or is it like a mall or maybe even a coffee shop today? Anyway, you overhear these guards talking about, the, about executing the king or someone in authority. What do you do? Being as we're all sitting here in church, of course we would go. And we would notify the person of highest authority that we could get access to. And we'd let them know of these dastardly crimes that were about to be committed and that were being planned. Having done the right thing and communicating the intentions of these individuals, you are recognized for the deed that you have done in bringing the attempt to light. You even go on record as the one who has done this. But there is no reward. Now sometime later a man comes along, let's call him Haman, familiarity with the story, right? For no rec recognizable reason, no skill or specific talents, no experience, he is appointed to a position high up in command over everyone but the big cheese himself. How would this make you feel? Have you ever experienced this in life? Maybe at work or on a team? 
This is how I imagine Mordecai as I'm reading this when Haman is elevated to a position of authority. When Mordecai refuses to bow down before Haman, do you suppose it could be bitterness towards his unworthy rise to fame? As we read, we find the answer is no. But then why does Haman not bow, or Mordecai not bow before Haman? If we look at the history before us, we can also rule out his refusal to bow before a king based on the second commandment, the commands that he shall not bow down before any idols. You see, this did not necessarily apply to the Jews and the kings as they would bow to honor a king, but not out of worship. So what is it about Haman that Mordecai refuses to acknowledge or honor? With the help of commentaries and study Bibles, we can begin to make a connection of Haman, the Agagite, to King Agag. Now bear with me, there's a lot of words that I could get stumbled up over here, but we'll make it through. And King Agag ruled the Amalek, or the Amalekites. Now this is important because as we look back at Exodus, it is the Amalekites who attacked the Israelites as they fled Egypt. It is God's command to Israel to blot out the memory of, the, of Amalek from under heaven in Deuteronomy 25. It is God's command to Israel to blot out, sorry, it is Saul's attack on Amalek, King Agag, and most but not all of the city's population in where they kill them. With this in mind, we can begin to think Romeo and Juliet. The Montague family versus the Capulet family, bitter rivals that wanted nothing more than to see each other destroyed. This, this is why Mordecai would not honor Haman. Because Haman, the Amalekite descendant of King Agag, was the enemy of Mordecai, the De- the Benjamite descendant of King Saul, and they were bitter rivals. With this setting the stage, not only can we better understand why Mordecai wouldn't honor Haman and bow, but we can also understand why Haman would seek out to destroy not only Mordecai, but any Jew he could find. With this continuing war raging on, where do we see God? Another question I pose is how have we seen God interact with the Israelites before this. In God's decrees of war on the nations that have come out against Israel, Israel was given very specific instruction on how they were to deal with the enemies of God. In Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 through 18, we see God instruct the Israelites that they should completely destroy them in regards to their enemies. He goes on to give reason that if they do not, the sins of their enemies will rub off on you They will teach you their bad ways, and you will come to sin against the Lord your God. If we continue to follow the Israelites in and through the promised land, we see them continue not to follow God's instructions to completely destroy their enemies, and they are misled by those that they begin to live with and amongst, and they begin to sin against God. It also goes on, and we see that in their failing to wipe out the enemies of God, They are also met with enslavement. They are cast out of the lands that they are promised. They begin to live as exiles. You see, God would allow his people to be captured for failure to obey his commands. Did God turn his back on his people? No. It was us who turned our back on him. It was the Israelites who failed to keep to God's commands. But it was God who stood behind the curtain watching as his people were being misled and mistreated. You see, I have four boys, as Ken was saying, and we just found out a couple weeks ago that the fifth one that we're expecting in September is also a boy, which I was hoping for a girl, but slightly relieved when it was a boy because starting out with twins, we have kind of everything we need to continue carrying through with this one. Hand-me-downs are a good friend while we're at seminary. My boys are all boys. We brought two of them because the other two would be a little bit of a handful, and it was an early morning this morning. But my youngest, for the moment, is Hawken. Hawken is two years old. And uh, he climbs. He jumps. He loves to climb on the furniture and in the windows. And there are times I've warned him over and over again to get down. Stop doing that. You're going to get hurt. 
But he continues. And there have been times where as a father, I had to sit back and allow him to take a fall that would scare or mildly hurt him. Now, this wasn't done as a father who enjoyed to see my son fail, although I will admit there are times that I do laugh. Or as a father who enjoys seeing his child hurt. No, this was done as a father who deeply cares for his child, but needs to allow him to feel the pain of his mistakes, the consequences for not listening or taking the warning signs. You see, like me allowing one of my children to feel the pain of their actions, God allows us to feel the pain of ours. As in the case I mentioned above, when this happens, I imagine God sitting at the edge of his seat, ready to jump into action at the moment it is needed. And we saw this with the Israelites in Egypt. We saw this as the Israelites failed in moving into the, and beyond the promised land. They were met with adversity. They were persecuted, killed, and even enslaved. But when they remembered their God, when they cried out to their God, he heard their groaning and he remembered them. As we look at this story, we can see that Esther and Mordecai are still living in this time where Israel is not the strong, united people of God, but scattered and living as exiles, afraid to reveal who they truly are in a land that is not theirs, among a people that are not theirs. So with Esther 3, we could look into the details and the coincidence of the casting of lots that Haman does, and how it fell during the time of Passover and the celebration of Purim, as the time when the Israelites celebrated leaving uh, the persecution of Egypt, where they, it's a, a time of festival and celebration, but, so we get that picture looking ahead. But instead, since Pastor Mark gave me one of the most bleak and uh, challenging texts of Esther, where, as we read, there really is no hope in this story. As he talked about last week, there is no God mentioned. There is no crying out to God in Esther. So if we look at just the text of chapter 3, there is no hope. You see, so in holding to this text, I want us to look at the end of the text first. A text that ends with Haman and King Xerxes sitting down for drinks. As riders, messengers are taking this decree, this death sentence, that will allow the Jews to be wiped from existence within the kingdom. There is not an outcome that looks favorable for the Jews as these decrees are irrevocable. In the law of the land, they could not just be overwritten or taken back. The king would not just stand up and say, my bad, I'm just going to put my stamp on this and put this one away. No, if it was signed into decree and it was given law, it was carried out. Where is God? As children of God, how do we deal with these scenarios when they are encountered in our own lives? The idea of being stuck in a hopeless situation where we cannot see a way out. Maybe some of you here are in a place like this now. I know many of us, like myself, can relate to this at one point in our lives or another. Whether it be the loss of a job, difficulties with finances, health issues, loss of a loved one or a close friend. You see, if we apply the lessons that we learn from the Israelites, which they often forgot, the lessons that we often forget, we are not left as someone without hope. We are not left to chance and good fortune. We are not left to the will of those conformed to this life, to this world. You see, we can have hope and take rest and assurance like the Israelites in that we have a God to call out to. If we remember his promises to us, if we remember his power and control over our lives, his ability to provide and comfort, he will hear our cries and remember his promises. You see, God comforted the Israelites as Joshua became their leader, as they were transitioning from Joshua to Moses as they were getting ready to go into the promised land where Moses was no longer welcome. And they were reminded, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. It was not the the doing of Moses that had gotten them there, but God. The words of encouragement that were sent from Jeremiah to God's people living in exile, 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You see, like these words to the Israelites, these promises of protection, we can also look to the words from Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 10, verse 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Is God promising us that we will not have trouble? Is God promising that we will not encounter the Hamans in our lives? No. One of my former pastors from time living out, this time we spent out in New Jersey, uh, Bruce Hillman, He posted uh, a while back about these verses, saying that we were wrong in saying that God will not give us more than what we can handle. And I really liked how he put it, and so I'm going to read uh, what he had written. God gives us a cross to carry and invites us to walk with him into and through the valley of the shadow of death. Cross bearers have more than they can handle. The truth is, God allows us to have more than we can handle because his strength is made perfect in weakness. Where the glory and power of man ends at the intersection of hopelessness, we meet the God of power and grace if we have not met him before. You may have more than you can handle. That is okay. Because you have one who is sufficiently capable of seeing you through the storm on his power, not yours. Come weary ones, take my yoke. I will give you rest. You see, like Haman and Esther, or Mordecai and Esther, we are not promised that life will be easy, but we are given a way out. The way that we are able to stand up under hopeless situations is through the leading and guiding of God the Father, through sacrifice and and the resurrection of the Son. You see, from the Father sitting at the edge of his seat, ready to spring into action as we call out to him, so he may come alongside us, and help us in our struggles. My own testimony is not one of great scandal. Crazy stories of rebellion, drugs, or whatnot. There may or may not be a couple of fast vehicles involved, but that's about as far as it goes. My testimony is being able to look back at all the things that I have gone through in life. All the times that I was the one who turned my back on God by being a lukewarm Christian. But in spite of all of this, I am able to look back at my life and see a God who has been masterfully carrying out his plan for my life, whether I had recognized, been a willing participant, or whatnot in those moments. You see, a God who allowed me to follow my intuition to get a degree in elementary education. A God who who had me follow um, or just come across a job opportunity that would teach me communication and management skills. A God that nudged me into youth ministry through a leader asking if I would help with crowd control. A God that convinced me to say, why not when applying for a full-time youth ministry position at Triumph? And as I sat back and looked at all of these pieces, a baffled young man that finally started to see what God had been doing all along the pieces of the puzzle and how they had prepared me for the ministry in which he was calling me, where I could sit and look back and say, look at what you have already done. I couldn't have planned this. Look what you are continuing to do. And finally, the willingness to say, I am ready. What is next? You see, with a text that leaves us grasping for hope, with situations in life that leave us feeling crushed, And with no way out, God is waiting in anticipation to be called to come alongside. To be asked to step out from behind the curtain and to join us at the center stage to walk through the mess with us. You see, we have one who is capable and invites us to call out his name. We will find ourselves in seemingly hopeless situations like Esther and Mordecai, watching or learning of the riders carrying forth this message of death and destruction. But like them, we must learn to trust 
in his promises. This is where we end today. Amen. I think we're going to call forward the worship team at this time. Or the ushers. Ushers, sorry. So if the ushers will come forward, I'll, I'll pray for the offering. And so if you pray with me. God, we just thank you <clears throat> for even amongst these bleak and seemingly hopeless situations that you show us in your scripture. God, that we would seek out your promises for us, that we would remember them in the hard times, and that we would remember them in the good times, God. And God, as, as uh, Word of Life is, is going through the transition of trying to find a pastor, and God, I pray that you would just continue to leave them open to the promises that you have for them and the, and the call that you're putting on their hearts, and that you would bring forward the correct person for that position, God. Um, that you continue to provide and sustain the church in the, in, in the interim, God. And we just pray that you blessing over these offerings uh, today as they are received um, and that they would go to the, uh, to the work and the advancement of your kingdom, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So as we go today, having looked at the despair of Esther and Mordecai, I want to leave you with these words from Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Despair is not where this or our story ends. So as we go, go trusting in the promises of God. I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the waves. My soul will rest in your embrace.